This is Rabbi Sachs coming to you from the Chai Center and welcome to the Chai Academy. The Chai Academy is a um, is courses and classes delivered online live and it is designed it started because of COVID and it's designed to make you think and, and um and it generally focused on Jewish content, um, topics of Jewish interest. We have been we have been focusing for the past couple of weeks on modern day Israel, some fascinating stories and tidbits, etc., uh, of information. Now, we we uh, we were we were talking about the Ethiopian Jews, and we had a whole segment on that. Um, and then because of Purim, we 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 put that on hiatus. And we uh, focused on Purim, the holiday of Purim, and now we'll just I want to finish off the Ethiopian segment. So, so Ethiopian Jews, part two. So once again, they're called the, they're called falashas, um, the homeless one, the homeless ones, the landless ones, and and uh, they they um, they've always claimed they're Jews. They're Jews from the the uh, the um, the children of Dan, one of the t original twelve tribes, and the the you know, and we discussed at great length the controversy. I'm not going to go into the controversy now. They're Jews and they're not Jews. Where we left off last time was there was such a thing called Operation Moses. Operation Moses essentially was a clandestine up airlift of Ethiopian. Jews, either from Ethiopia or from Sudan, and into Israel, and um, it, it, you know life became somewhat uh, untenable for them, and the 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 you know the the uh, prime minister, the president of the country, was started to target Jews, etc. So Israel got involved, and seven thousand Ethiopian Jews went to Israel. Now, so some of them actually. They, they, in order to get to Israel, they, they actually walked through Sudan. They walked through the Sudan, and they were able to get to Israel that way. So some from Ethiopia, some, from, some through Sudan. And, um, but then, as we discussed, a journalist, or a couple of journalists in Israel, started to comment about the Falashas coming to Israel, and what an incredible thing it is. So Sudan, Ethiopia were pressured, stop this. No more people going to Israel. Of course, Ethiopia, like like most of the African countries, had aligned with the Arabs, and therefore they were part of the boycott of Israel. And and um, they, they 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 there was no there was severed ties. I mean, Israel and Ethiopia at one point were you know had were allies, and then Ethiopia severed ties because of the because of the Arab influence. And um, and Sudan, I don't know if they ever had ties. Of course, Sudan is Omar territory, so enough enough said there. So that was Operation Moses. That's where um, that's when the first Falashas, the first, they call themselves Beta Yisrael, the House of Israel. That's when they first came. But then, after that, after. Um, there was something an unknown, and it was only 500 Ethiopians, and that was called Operation Joshua. That was led by the United States. So the United States managed to get another 500 Ethiopian Falashas out of dangerous territory and and into into Israel. And then what most people are familiar with because it happened later on, it happened in the 90s, is something called Operation Solomon. What Operation Solomon essentially was that they bribed, they bribed officials in order to, per head, price per head, in order to get Jews from the Ethiopian Falashas, the Ethiopian Jews, into Israel. Now, the, the, the reason why it became such a crisis and the reason why, and I believe it was the UJA, raised a lot of money um, and there were people pouring in money in order to save these lives, is the rebels attacked. They attacked the capital of Ethiopia, right? So Addis Ababa, uh, Baba, 
right? And and um, so they attacked, and the Ethiopian Jews found themselves in dire, dire straits. And um, so the Israel once again got involved, struck a deal with with Ethiopia, and managed to get more more Jews out. It was it was a massive operation, just a massive operation. If you can imagine, there were 34, at least 34 airlifts that took Ethiopians into Israel, 34. And I forget what they paid per head, but it was an astronomical amount. They say, they say that, that um, there, there was the, the largest, what they did, by the way, is they removed all the seats. They removed all the seats from the planes and they packed in Ethiopians. Good morning, Bonnie. They packed in Ethiopians into the plane, and um, and there was there was grandfathers and grandmothers and mothers and brothers and sisters and babies. There was even there's even stories told of babies being born on the plane en route to 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 Israel. One particular plane they packed it. I think this is the record of 1,087 people were packed into a plane, no seats, everybody's sitting on the floor. <laughs> they tell a tale, but when, when at one point, I don't know if it's a true tale, but at one point, they, um, somebody was sitting on the, on, you know, sitting on the floor in, the, in this plane, in the, in, the, in, the, you know, in the cavity of the plane, and they're sitting on the floor, and you know, they brought wood with them, and they hit a little fire, and they got some, I guess, lamb soup going. But that's, you know, I don't know if that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a myth or not, but um, but you know I, I don't think the Ethiopians they've never been on a plane, so they didn't really know what to expect, and um, and all all told I think um, there, there was at some point after this there was 135,000 Ethiopians in Israel. I don't know when if there's more now I don't exactly when this number is from, and Israel tried to uh, absorb them. And um, and it wasn't without issue. There was there was racism. There was, it was even a few years ago. I don't know if you remember. There was protests, etc., because the Ethiopian the Ethiopians felt that they were they were um, discriminated against um, just out of sheer racism. And um, so there was there was riots. There was protests. There was controversy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now there was also there was also during this time of, of Operation Moses, which we discussed last time, Operation Joshua and Operation Solomon. There was a lo- a large part of Israel who was opposed to this, and it wasn't because uh, they're black, and it wasn't because of on any racial grounds whatsoever. They just said they were arguing that this is not what the law of return meant. The law of return meant to any Jew, Jew, and it says, and the Ethiopians were not proven necessarily. These falashas were not necessarily proven to, to to be Jewish, and and as we said, it was Rabbi Avadia Yosef who, who who was the first one. He was the Sephardic chief rabbi at the time in in the seventies, and he accepted them. But it was it was you know, and that kind of broke the dam. But it wasn't without controversy. Because once again, the law of return is any Jew can return to Israel and immediately gain citizenship. It's their right. It's their birthright being born a Jew. Right. So it got sticky because are the Ethiopians Jews or not? And we discussed there was there was there was um, a lot of controversy. Some people felt they were just being used by Ethiopians who wanted a better life. And and we know that to be true with Russian. When the, when there was this Russian influx into Israel, yes, you know, in the in the Exodus in, in, in the seventies, and then of course after after Glasnost and Perestroika and, and Boris Yeltsin and, and Gorbachev and right after that, we know that many Russians, non Jews, took full advantage of of clamoring to Israel, claiming they were Jewish, and and essentially what they did is they. It, it's, which is, I understand why you want to get out of Russia, but the minute you say you're Jewish and that you're accepted, it creates a whole conundrum. It, it, it's it's a Pandora's box. Who's a Jew? I'm not even talking about the old fight of who is a Jew, which we've discussed, 
but rather the argument of are these are these people Jewish or they're not Jewish? Some of them were clearly not Jewish. So then, if if they if they if the rabbis they said, okay, we want to officiate you, congratulations, you're engaged to be married, but we're not allowing you to get married because we don't have document evidence that you're Jewish. And um, and and people had to say, well, my rabbi was so and so, or my classmate was so and so. He can vouch for me. She can vouch for me. Um, my my parents or grandparents are buried, you know, in 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 here and in there in the Ukraine, and it was it was it was very very difficult. And by the way, it's still difficult today. It's still difficult today that there there are people who specialize in trying to prove genealogy, so that certain that these people can be accepted as Jews. Some of them clearly are not. Right, but they're in, they're in, and God bless them. But um, but it, you know, whenever you have, whenever you have confusion, it's never good. So you can welcome them in as as, as non-Jews. That's great. You welcome them in, in as Jews. That's great. But there was confusion that created that created a lot of issues and a lot of animosity, and and um, and until today, I think they 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 they, they struggle. They struggle with it. So Israel, interestingly, like the United States, has become somewhat of a melting pot, right? Some because of Ethiopia and Russians, and, and uh, the former Soviet Union, I should say, so Ukrainians and Russians and, and Belarusians and, you know, the, 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 all the former Soviet states. But also, Israel is home to many people who made Aliyah, right? They, they uh, in the United States every year. I mean, a tremendous amount of people make aliyah. Um, Jew, we're talking about Jews. We're not even talking about non-Jews who made aliyah, but Jews of plenty made aliyah. But not only from the states, from the states and from Europe. And and my opinion on Europe, by the way, that I, I don't understand. Europe has never been good for the Jews. Europe, <laughs> back then, hundreds of years ago, and even today. It's just not a hospitable place for Jews, and and uh, you know the fact that Jews are are in France and yet they're not allowed to wear a kippah because it's it's dangerous, or the Jews, um, you know, in Germany where where it's it's become a very once again a very hostile environment. Um, it, it's it's I just don't understand Europe. I don't understand why, you know, just let it go, let it go. I understand your families and business, etc. Um, I was I was traveling once, and it was a stopover for a few hours in Frankfurt, Germany. And um, and we were we were flying from um, I don't even remember flying from somewhere in Europe. Um, I think we flew from I, I don't remember honestly, but we stopped over in Frankfurt from Frankfurt to the United States. So because it's going to the United States. It was um, stricter security, another set of security. Even though you're in the airport, you got to do security again. And as I was traveling with a few people, and there were, the plane was it was a you know the plane was a Delta flight, um, and and uh, it was it was a packed flight. It was a seven eighty seven, I think, I think maybe it was seven forty seven. But there's a lot of people on this plane. We, us, few Jews, entered together. And would you know, myself and all my traveling partners were taken into a private room for additional screening. Right? You tell me if Germany's really come a long way. And I said that to them. They said, no, 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 it's random, it's random. I said, this is far from random, buddy. I told them, you know, you, so, you know, you have to take off your shoes and they have to empty your, 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 your hand luggage. and. And uh, they wand you down, but you know, and you're in a, you're in a room. It's not just right there and then. No, they take you, they shuffle you off, and it was 100% of our party were taken in for extra screening. Anyway, that that's you know, um, I I I, uh, I try not to buy anything at these airports. Um, so um, so Aliyah. There was, the, we all know about Aliyah. Aliyah, the, Israel's numbers are, are growing and growing exponentially so, um, of Jews waiting, wishing, hoping, and finally coming 
to Israel and making Aliyah. Now, there is something. So we know what Aliyah is. And, and you can go, by the way, you can, you, you go to the consulate and um, you fill out some paperwork. You have to get a letter signed by a rabbi. I, I, you know, I saw you write a letter. And sometimes I get called by the consulate as a double check. But, um, and then, then you're in, you're in, and they, they, you know, they put you in an old palm and you get there. You know, they, they, it's, 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 a, it's a very well greased oil, a very well oiled machine. Um, the question is what happens after the old palm, after. And then you have to find a job. That becomes not so easy. But so in addition to aliyah, there's something called yurida. Aliyah means to rise. Yurida means to descend. And there are Israelis who basically, and there's many of them, that they are considered yorates. They, they yored. They descend from Israel. They, they descend. Where are they going? Where are these Israelis going? So so they're going to the United States. They're also going to Europe, which once again boggles my mind. They're going to South Africa. They're going to Mexico. And, um, and, and they, 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 they go. They go. They travel. Um, it, it's, it's, so if Israel has six million Jews, an argument right now, an argument could be made that Israel would have had seven million Jews. So close to ten, uh, over ten percent of of um, of Israelis moved out of Israel. Right, and I remember I was in a taxi in Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, and the taxi driver said, and he was talking to me, and he was yelling, he was screaming, he's very passionate. He goes, "Where are they all running? A million Israelis. Where do they go? Why are they running? They're running. They're leaving Israel. Ah, it's terrible." Now. Um, they, they, they um, I think they, I think they're, they're running first of all for a few reasons. One is that they, um, and they're viewed as deserters by, by, by the Israelis. They're not viewed with a kind eye. But some of them are moving because um, it, it's economic reasons. The United States is, has more economic opportunities than Israel. Israel is kind of still less so, but it, it was, but it was in the 60s. It was more of a socialist type of economic structure so 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 they're leaving and and uh, they came to the land right the 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 land of opportunity they came they came to the golden of medina um which is the united states interesting to note when they come here secular israelis do not involve themselves for the most part in jewish life they don't secular israelis hang out with other secular israelis and they don't really belong to a community it's just an, inter an interesting, um, an interesting. Whereas the more of the, the, the less secular Israelis, they they will join a community, they will find their place, um, and and they will become part and parcel of the fabric of the Jewish community. Where secular Israelis, they, they, the closest they get is they, they will uh, you know choose a favorite Israeli restaurant that they can hang out in with their friends. Um, so they come for for economic reasons they come for opportunity however what what is found an incredible statistic with is that those that were taxi drivers in Israel end up being taxi drivers in the United States and there's this famous famous story with um, Golda Meir the Prime Minister of Israel she was in the United States visiting and she went into a restaurant uh, she didn't keep kosher, and she went into a restaurant, and the Israeli waiter that was serving her, he told her in Hebrew that there's some, some ham. Be careful, because there's ham in the ingredients. So she, she looked, and, and she probably didn't eat ham. So she looked to the Israeli, um, and she said to him, you know, you're from Israel? He goes, yes, I'm from Israel. She had this conversation, and she goes, you're a waiter in the United States? He goes, yes, I'm a waiter here. And she said, what did you do back in Israel? So he looks at her and goes, I was a waiter. So that's just an interesting tidbit. The waiter there, waiter here, maybe it's better tips. Who knows? I don't know. Um, generally in Israel, they're not that big in tipping. Like if you ask somebody, what should you tip? Like the taxi driver, they go, what are you crazy? You tip? You don't tip. It's not a culture to tip. Restaurant, not a culture to tip. Changing a little bit. Um, 
And it's not just, by the way, taxi drivers and waiters that come to, 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 to out of Israel. It's also professors, doctors, academia, you know, they leave because there's more opportunity here to, to, to explore. Um, but another reason, to be fair, another reason is, is this Israeli-Arab conflict. It gets tiring. And, um, and of course, there's this, this draft, there's the mandatory draft that you, you know, from 18 to 21, you're three years you're in the army. That means you have to um, suspend your, uh, you know, college. So, and then you have, so most Israelis to the army, they're loyal, they don't want to desert. Um, so they go to the army, but you're not done. Because until, you know, for the next, for the next uh, you know, till your 40s, you have something called miluim, reservists. Once a month, well, I'm sorry, one month a year or three weeks a year, you got to report for duty. Uh, you know, and that, and the, so Israel, they, they factored that in with your job, et cetera, and you can't be penalized. It's like jury duty here, but it's every year. And, um, and uh, they don't want to do that. And we find, just as a, a parenthetically, is that when Israelis, when they finish with their three years, and even though they're planning to go back to Israel, they get out. They, they leave, and they go where the cheapest place their, their, their shekels go. They go to South America, they go to Kathmandu, Nepal, Thailand. That's why there's all these tourists. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of tourists that generally they're Israelis that just got out of the army, and they took a break before they go back. To, to school or to work. Um, when the economy is bad in Israel, they bolt. You know, I remember seeing a cartoon, and you probably saw it too. It's a very famous cartoon, right? And that is, it's it's in Ben Gurion Airport. There's a long line of of Israelis in this cartoon waiting to get on to get through through uh, you know onto a plane through immigration, etc. And the last guy in the line is being spoken to by the second to last guy in the line. And he turns to him and says, last one out, shut the lights, right? Because there was such, such a mass exodus. When, and, and if you remember, I mean, the, 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 the shekel was so, um, you know, and then the, the 60s and the 70s, the shekel was in, was in the 70s, oh my goodness. The shekel was in dire straits, in fact, so much so, that the, the the currency they have today is called shekel chadash, the new shekel, because the old shekel wasn't worth anything. You know, it was like seventeen thousand shekels for a dollar, or, you know, or, or more. I don't know. So um, then there was a mass exodus. Another interesting tidbit is that you ask, you ask most Yordim, you ask most Israelis that have, 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 have come down, you know, left Israel, and they come to the United States, and they'll tell you, no, no, I have plans, I'm, it's only temporary, this is only hiatus, I'm going to go back to Israel, I'm going to settle in Israel, and they, you know, here they are, they're 45 with, with, with the two, three kids, and they still tell you, is that Hashem? We're gonna go to Israel. I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna leave in the, leave in Atanya. I'm gonna leave in Etzalia. I'm gonna live in Tel Aviv. I'm gonna live here, there, and the other. I have an apartment that I'm renting out to somebody. I'm gonna go back. So it's a, a kind of eight out of ten tell you they're gonna go back. The other the other two out of ten, the other twenty percent are kind of more realistic and they see themselves as a permanent home where they are. But even the ones who've been living here for years and they have citizenship. Here, they, um, they, they still tell you that their ultimate plan is to go back to the promised land, is to go back to the holy land of Israel. What is that? What is that? So uh, my opinion, I opine here, is that it's a soul level, right? So my, my parents came from London, England, to the United States. I was 13 or 14, right? And, and uh, they made, they emigrated. Uh, they emigrated, and it was, um, um, Reagan was president. And, um, and, and they, they emigrated to the United States. I've never heard them once say, our plan, our ultimate plan is to go back and, and uh, live in London, North London, East London. 
just just it's not there. But Israelis, they're funny. They're funny. Their ultimate plan, their penultimate plan, is that we are going back. And my answer to that is, Amen. Amen. Um, they 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 should go back. Um, it's it's nice. It's nice. You know, it's it, there's you know there, there's one Jewish homeland. Why not? God bless. You can find any questions rabbi at the chai center dot com. You can also uh, you can also uh, ask a question here, and we'll attempt to answer. Until we meet again.